All right, so the first chapter is introduction. We'll give you a flavor for what this course is about. Okay. Okay, Professor Feynman is a, sort of a folk hero in the physics community. Yeah. Um, he says he learned the difference between knowing the name of something and knowing something. And that's what we are about in this course. We don't want to know the name of something. We want to know how it works. Okay. Physics is a very fundamental science. It's the foundation for ideas critical to all scientific fields. Yeah. So it's the foundation on which many sciences are built. Okay. So that's uh, what we want to do. We want to understand stuff. And um, my, I'm sure you'll agree with this, the more you know, the less stressful your life will be. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right, so here's a picture. Here are these birds flying in formation. Why are they doing that? Well, you can fly independently and you won't run into each other. It's, uh, it causes less wind resistance. It causes less wind resistance. Okay, so what our friend here is saying is, okay, so you fly independently, uh, and I'm just going to make up numbers. I just want you to understand the concept. So bird A flies from point A to B. I mean, this, and let's say it takes it a thousand joules. Okay. Now, if, if you fly in formation like that, if it will take you 800 joules of energy, then you'll do it. And that's why they do it. It takes less energy if you're flying in formation to go from point A to B. Okay. And why does it do that? And that's what our friend just said. Okay. So in this formation, do you know who the, who's working the hardest? This person is, this bird is working the hardest. This bird has less resistance. All these guys have less resistance, and they're spending less energy. Well, why is this guy doing it? He's working the hardest. I'm sorry? No, so these guys, what they do is, so this guy's working the hardest. He works hard for five minutes, and then he goes to the back of the line. There you go. Okay. What's that? So, here's, here's a very nice thought. For any given problem, do you know where the best solution is? I'm sorry? Uh, nature has the best solution to every problem. Why does nature, how come nature has the best solution to every problem? It's got, it's had millions of years to figure out the best solution. It's had millions of tries to do the wrong, I mean, test out all the wrong solutions. Okay, so for any problem, all right. Uh, do you know anywhere else that this thing is done? You know, you guys have seen bikers on the road? They're drafting. NASCAR cars, they're drafting. Okay. So when you draft, when you have low resistance in biking, you can spend as much as less, 50% uh, less energy. Okay. All right, so this is a very good solution. Okay, so that's the kind of stuff we want to understand. Okay. And I'll illustrate uh, with another problem soon. Okay. So, so physics concerns with questions that are basic to all natural sciences. Physics is all around us, okay? And we'll apply these to health science applications, all the principles we learn. <clears throat> all right, um, uh, so here's Poiseuille's law. What this, again, you don't have to memorize anything tests are open book, 
Okay, you just have to understand stuff. And uh, don't be afraid of formulas. Um, we're going to, we're just going to try and understand as much as possible, okay? So what this law says is, so if you have a pipe and you want a fluid to flow through it, Q is the flow rate, okay? Flow rate just tells you how many gallons a minute are, of the fluid are flowing and so on, okay? So this could be a blood vessel. We are interested in that, okay? This could be a pipe, pipe that is bringing water to your house. This could be a pipe that is pumping oil from one, the oil fields to the refineries, yeah, and so on. So one of your concerns will be, you know, you want to um, control the flow rate, okay? Or you'll be interested in the flow rate, okay? So uh, let's look at this expression. P2 is the pressure at this point. P1 is the pressure at this point, okay? So you see if P2 is equal to P1, what happens? If it's the same pressure, where it stays still? So see if P2 is equal to P1, this will be zero. No fluid will flow. You want to make fluid flow, you have to have a pressure difference. And that's what your heart is doing, to make blood flow throughout your body the heart is creating pressure, higher pressure near the heart, and there's lower pressure elsewhere, okay? All right, what is R? R is the radius, okay? Radius of the pipe, and that'll be important. We'll come to that in a second. Eta, this is a Greek symbol, eta. That is viscosity. Viscosity is, is the friction in the fluid. Okay, so let me, so let's illustrate that point. Okay, so let's say you had a pipe. It was, so everything else is the same. The pressure difference is the same. I had water or I had honey flowing. Which one would flow more? Water. So eta, the viscosity for water is smaller, okay? Viscosity tells you how thick the fluid is or how much friction there is. Okay. Did you guys understand that? Higher the viscosity, lower the flow rate. So let's illustrate this with an example. Uh, you guys uh, know Prudhoe Bay in Alaska? They have oil fields there and uh, they pump oil from there to the south of Alaska. Now, during the winter, it's very cold and the oil will get thicker and its viscosity increases. So the flow rate decreases. So how do you fix that? You guys understand the question? So what they do is they put heaters around the pipe. They heat the oil, they make this number smaller so the flow rate increases. Otherwise, you could increase the flow rate by increasing the pressure, but that costs you money. Okay. All right, so anyway, this is an equation. I was just telling you a long story. Okay, now here's the problem. So let's say after class, you go eat lunch. Yep. Now after a heavy meal, what the body has does is, if your flow, blood flowing to the intestine is, uh, let's say a gallon, a, uh, a liter a minute, after a meal, it increases the flow rate to the intestines by a factor of five. The blood flow rate increases by a factor of five. Why is that? I'm sorry? No, 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 no. Well, your stomach and intestine has already digested the food. What's that? To flush it out. Flush what on? What you ate. No, no, no. So you ha why did you eat? For the nutrients. 
You don't want the nutrients to pass. You want to go pick up the gold. No, 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 no. no. Nutrient absorption. You don't want to leave any money on the table. So how did body, the body, do you guys, are you guys understanding this? So how do you increase the flow rate by a factor of five? Here, we're going to, I'm sorry? So we are going to increase this by a factor of five. Well, you can increase the pressure difference by a factor of five. <laughs> Your heart would have to work a lot harder. You don't want to do that. Okay. You can't change the thickness of the blood, viscosity of the blood. So here's how we do it. Okay, what we're going to do is change the radius of your blood vessel. Change the diameter. That's how your body controls blood flow. Okay, so let's, and let's see, this thing is to the power four. So let's see, if I do 1.5 R to the power four, Okay, and pull out your calculators. Do 1.5. Okay, do 1.5 to the power of 4. And 1.5 to the power of 4 is 5. 0.06 r to the power of five. Okay, so you see, by increasing the radius by 50%, you have increased the flow rate by 500%. Okay. So that's how you make sure that you don't leave any money on the table. Okay. Did you guys understand that? So here's another application that I'll show you quickly. And this is, that's, this is what our goal is in the course. We want to understand why stuff is happening the way it's happening, okay? So, yes. so we are warm-blooded animals. That's what I've been told. Okay? And we like to maintain a core body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, okay? So this is, this is when it's warm, warm ambient temperature like in Florida. And here is uh, when it's cold, when the outside is cold, like in Alaska. Okay. So if it was cold outside and your body was like this, what would be the problem? So let's say it's minus 10 degrees Celsius. Okay. And it, you had blood flowing to your extremities. What would happen? You'd lose a lot of heat. Okay. And to maintain that body temperature, you would have to use up a lot of energy. So how do you fix that? Okay, so if it was cold like that and you had blood flowing like this, you could certainly not hibernate. <laughs> You'd have to be constantly eating. <laughs> so what do you do? Your body is smart. Like I said, nature is very smart. You cut out blood flow to the extremities. You only have fluid blood flowing to this in the core. How do you cut off blood flow to the extremities? You just learned it. Close the Very good. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So that's how you control fluid flow. When you want uh, more flow, you dilate it. And when you want to um, cut off flow, you constrict the blood vessels. So that's how you control flow. Okay. So again, uh, like I said, all answers to all questions are on the slides. You want to read every slide. Okay? And uh, just get a sense for what it's talking about. Yeah. All right, so kinesiology is a subject which uh, teaches you how to use your body efficiently. Okay. So we don't have an intuitive feel to how to use our bodies most efficiently. And that's why we have coaches for every sport. Okay. 
and that's what they're teaching you how to be more efficient. So, you know. So we'll study motion, and uh, to study motion, we'll uh, uh, have to learn concepts of distance, time, velocity, acceleration, and all, and we'll do that in the next chapter. Okay. Okay, we like to do work. I mean, we want to do work. And it takes energy to do work. Yep. Now, one of the things is we want to be as efficient as possible, right? Um, we want the most bang for the buck. Yep. For a given amount of energy used, uh, you want to get the most amount of work. Okay. By the way, energy is a central concept in physics, and so We'll talk about that. So here is a, a table, and like I said, you have to study all tables. Mechanical efficiency of the human body. What does this mean? Okay, how much work have you done for the amount, for a given amount of energy you use? Okay. By the way, we just had the Olympics, and if you saw any swimming event, do you guys know all the swimmers, they try to stay underwater as long as possible. Well, they'll jump off the starting board and they'll stay underwater as long as possible. Why is that? There you go. See, she's paying attention. See, she, see swimming underwater is 4% as efficient. Swimming on the surface is 2%. Okay, so you stay underwater as long as possible, okay, and then come up. Yep. All right, cycling is 20% efficient. Swimming is 2% efficient. Same person. Why is such a huge difference? Less resistance. What's that? No, so efficiency is, so if I gave you 100 bucks, and if you buy, bought $10 worth of stuff with 100 bucks, you're 10% efficient. I'm sorry? No, 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 so what this table is saying is, okay, so the unit of energy we'll use is, uh, is uh, joules. So for 100 joules of energy gotten from ATP, burning ATP, processing ATP, if you're cycling, you converted 20 joules of that into the motion of the bicycle. Okay. If you're swimming, you converted 2 joules of that into motion. Okay, so here is the secret to that. It turns out that if you use a single muscle, the maximum efficiency of a single muscle is 25%. In any activity, the more muscles you use, the less efficient your body is. Okay? Because it, it, what happens is it, the muscles tend to work against each other. Okay? So in cycling, you're using mostly one large muscle, and so the efficiency is high. Okay. In swimming, you're using many muscles that are working against each other, and uh, your efficiency is low. Okay. So this is the kind of stuff we want to understand. Did you guys understand that? Okay. Okay, so warm-blooded animals maintain a constant body temperature. So there are uh, many essential processes going on in your body. Uh, so for instance, um, you guys, mo just about everybody, we're roughly using uh, 100 joules of energy per second. Okay. So you're all glowing like a 100-watt bulb. Yep. 
Now, of course, that means if you retain that heat, what would happen to your body temperature? Yeah. And it'd go up. So you, your air conditioning system has to get rid of 100 joules of energy per second. Okay. So here's an amazing fact. Now, let's say if you go for a run, now your body will be producing 1,500 joules of energy per second. So what happened to your air conditioning system? It suddenly has to work 15 times harder. Otherwise, your temperature will go up. Okay. But anyway, we'll come to that. Okay, so... Uh, <clears throat> so you're producing essential... This excess heat is dissipated. So again, like I said, you have to get rid of that heat. And you get rid of that heat by perspiring. Okay. How does, how does that get rid of the heat? How does it cool down your body? Okay. So now we'll... Uh, Okay, so let's figure this out. Okay, uh, can you hold up your water bottle? Okay, so a cap full of that water is one gram of water, roughly. Okay, so you take one gram of water and you heat it by one degree Celsius. What you need is one calorie of heat. Okay, that's how the calorie is defined. Now, a food calorie, by the way, the calorie in this coffee, a food calorie is really 1,000 calories. Okay? So one food calorie is 1,000 calories. Yeah. <clears throat> so if they said that was 80,000 calories, I wouldn't buy it. So that's why this. <laughs> well, actually, it's not. <laughs> it's much more than that, right? It's too sweet. They're not selling hot coffee around here <laughs> yet. <laughs> All right. Now, here's the deal. So this is the secret. Uh, so let's make sure we understand this. You evaporate one gram of water. You convert it into steam. Do you guys know how much energy you need for that? Five hundred and forty calories. That's an enormous amount of heat. Okay, so when you want to get rid of heat, here's this is the best way to do it. Okay, so what do you do? Like you guys said, you sweat. Yeah. Now that's just half the job. Yeah. Now what you're hoping, like hell, is the sweat evaporates. And every time one gram of sweat evaporates, it takes away 540 calories of heat. Okay. Now here's the problem. If the humidity was 100%, what does 100% humidity mean? I'm sorry? A lot of moisture in the air. So, Okay, so what, uh, okay, so let's uh, look at, okay, so let's look at this table. What this says is saturated vapor density in grams per meter cube. This is a meter cube right here. Okay. So what this table says is, uh, at 10 degrees Celsius, or let's do 20 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature in this room. 
okay? At 20 degrees Celsius, the saturated vapor pressure is 600 grams per meter cube. 600 grams is roughly two soda cans, okay? Or this much water, hold up here. Okay, so if in this room there was 100% humidity, there would be that much water per meter cube. Okay, I mean, to keep this room comfortable, of course, we keep maintain hum humidity of uh, about 50%. So there's half that much water. Okay. Now, here's why we want to, uh, here's why we are talking about this. If there was 100% humidity in the room, your sweat won't evaporate. You won't be able to get rid of the heat. So, so let's say if somebody has a heat stroke in Florida where the humidity is always 120%, how the heck do you cool them down? I'm sorry? Well, throw them in an ice bath. What if you don't have an ice bath? What's that? So what you do is give them an alcohol rub. Is there alcohol in the atmosphere? No. So this alcohol will evaporate. It's zero percent humidity in alcohol. The only problem is alcohol only takes about 240 calories per gram. Well, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So that's why we didn't choose to sweat alcohol. We chose to sweat water because it takes more. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so that's the kind of, uh, okay. So that's what the body takes advantage of to get rid of excess heat. is dissipated by perspiring, okay. Now here's a, another interesting fact. So when it's hot outside, so let's say your body, uh, core body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius, and let's say it's 45, 45 degrees Celsius outside. Okay, now to get rid of heat, perspiring is the only mechanism for dissipating heat because heat is coming in via conduction, radiation heat is coming in. The only way you can lose heat is uh, by perspiring, okay? And also you do lose heat Every time you breathe out, there's moisture in, the, in your breath. And every time there's one gram of moisture in your breath, that's how much heat is uh, being dissipated. Okay. So again, like I said, your air conditioning system can turn on and off, okay, so to speak. So during exercise, as much, during exercise much more normal heat is gen more, more than normal heat is generated. So you do physical therapy when your muscles are weakened or if uh, you have uh, some of the nerve fibers are not firing properly and all that, okay. So physical therapy can improve mobility, address nerve-related conditions, manage pain, recovery from a sports injury and so on, okay. So you do all of that. <clears throat> okay, so... So when I lift my leg like this, I have to lift the weight of my leg as well. Okay? So if my muscles were weakened, I would not be able to do that. How would I slowly build up my strength? How do I eliminate the weight of my leg? If I did this in a pool, in water, Buoyancy eliminates weight. Okay. So, if a great deal of physical therapy can take place in water because water helps to support the weight of a person. So, that's. Uh, something you want to remember. Okay. 
Now we'll talk about respiration. Okay, so let's go back to our first few slides. Poisson's law. You learned that to make any fluid flow, you have to have a pressure difference. Okay. So let's go back here. Now, um, here is something that you want to be aware of. So here is absolute pressure, me meaning the actual pressure at the given location. And P0 is, P0 is atmospheric pressure, the pressure of the atmosphere. Okay? Now, if you go to a store and buy a gauge to measure pressure, so for instance, the pressure gauge that you have to measure tire pressures in your car, okay? what that gauge pressure is giving mostly, so you go to Wawa and uh, stick, measure the pressure, what it's giving you is this thing the actual pressure minus atmospheric pressure. So uh, atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure is about 15 PSI. What is the pressure in your tires? 32 PSI, okay. So, but that's gauge pressure. So that's gauge pressure. So the actual pressure is 32 plus 15, 47. Okay. So, the pressure in your tires is about two atmospheres, really it's three atmospheres. Okay. So what is the gauge pressure here outside? It's zero. Actual pressure minus atmospheric pressure is zero. Okay. When you're resting inside your lungs, the gauge pressure is zero. All right, so now let's see how do we breathe. So you want to breathe in. Right now the pressure here is zero and inside your lungs is zero. No air will flow in if the pressure is the same, right? You want to breathe in, what do you have to do? I'm sorry? Okay, okay let's start at zero. You have to first breathe in. The pressure outside cannot be changed. You have to somehow decrease the pressure inside your lung, okay, for air to flow in. So how do you decrease the pressure inside your lungs? Right? Are you guys following what I'm saying? I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, so, um, so you lower the diaphragm. You expand in the thoracic cavity. There's a partial vacuum, and we'll come to that uh, uh, in a little bit. Um, the reason you have partial vacuum is your alveoli are like balloons, and a rubber balloon ex uh, will uh, exert pressure. So to compensate for that, you have to have a, a thoracic cavity that has uh, negative pressure, partial vacuum. If, uh, I don't know if, uh, and if you're in the medical field and if your thoracic cavity is punctured, then your lungs will collapse. Yeah. So you lower the diaphragm, the pressure inside your lungs goes down, and now air flows from the outside to the inside. Okay, so you understand the problem. The outside pressure is constant. Okay, so you have to change the pressure inside your lung. When you want to breathe in, the pressure has to decrease inside the lung. And when you want to breathe out, the pressure inside the lung is higher than outside. Okay, so that's how you control fluid flow or air flow. And so when you, so air has uh, moved into your lungs, there's more air now. And now when you bring back your diaphragm up, the pressure inside is increased greater than outside and air will flow out. Okay. Did you guys understand that? Okay. So we'll talk more in details about this so examples. The body's use of pressure includes breathing, maintenance of reduced pressure in chest cavity to keep the lungs from collapsing. 
and the pressure in the eye to maintain its shape. So the inside your eye, pressure is higher, so it stays spherical. Okay. Pressure is a great indicator of uh, problems in your body. So that's one of the first things you go to a doctor's office, that's when one of the first things they'll measure. Okay. You go to an ophthalmologist, they're measuring the pressure in your eye. And the normal pressure range is 12 to 24. Uh, we'll talk about this units of millimeters of water, actually. Okay. Okay. So hearing. Okay. This is uh, this is your instrument. What is this guy doing? I'm sorry. Okay, so sound or a pressure wave, and the job of this guy is to convert this information into nerve impulses. Okay, that's what this guy understands. So you're taking a pressure wave and converting it into an electrical signal, which this guy understands. So we'll talk about how that conversion happens. It turns out that we can hear frequencies between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Okay. And if you're an old guy like me, probably I can't hear past 8,000 hertz or something like that. Okay. So this device doesn't work about those frequencies. Well, dogs have devices that work about those frequencies. Bats have devices that will work about those frequencies, okay. and so on. But so this, this works only in certain frequency ranges. Okay. <coughs> uh, we'll uh, learn about loudness is a perception of intensity. So the more intense sound, the louder it sounds. Okay. So one of the things we'll learn, for instance, is the following. Okay, so here's a thing that most people, a lot of people find surprising. Let's say you both are playing violin. Yeah. Now I want to hear it twice as loud. I'm sorry? Okay, so what we're going to do is, you two are playing the violin at a certain loudness. I want to hear it twice as loud, but what we, so what we're going to do is we're going to, make more people play the violin. How many more people do you think need to play? You said twice as loud as people. Four people. Everybody agree with that? That's what you would naturally think. It turns out that 20 people would have to play. You want to hear it twice as loud? you have to increase it by a factor of 10. If three people are playing, and you want to hear it twice as loud, 30 people have to play. Now you guys understand why in, in an orchestra they have so many violinists and stuff. Yeah. All right. So we'll uh, talk about stuff like that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> a lot of... Uh, this class goes up to 1050. Okay. So we'll, uh, you'll use ultrasonic scanners. Okay, so by the way, a lot of your ultrasonic scanners work in the range of 1 to 20 megahertz. Okay. Mega is a million hertz. So these are sound waves that your device cannot hear. Okay, that's why it's called ultrasonic. Okay. Do you guys know why you use a higher frequency? High frequency waves? Okay. okay, so here's a wave. Okay. This is the wavelength of the wave. And that's denoted by lambda. Okay. And if you use this wave, the smallest thing you can see is that big. Okay. 
So the smallest thing you can see is equal to the wavelength. What if you want to see smaller things? I'm sorry? Exactly. He's a smart fellow. Yeah. Now the velocity of a wave is frequency times wavelength. Okay. If the velocity is constant, you want to see something smaller, you have to decrease the wavelength, so you have to increase, you have to use a wave whose frequency is higher. Okay, and that's why you use these high frequency waves. Okay, with this 20,000 hertz, megahertz, you can see something as small as a tenth of a millimeter, roughly. A tenth of a millimeter is that small. Okay. So you want more resolution, you want to use higher frequency. Okay, now it turns out that uh, higher frequency penetrates less. Okay, so for instance, so those are the two things you're playing with. Okay. Oh, oops. So, okay. So here's the wavelength you're using. You, this wavelength will penetrate about 40, uh, 400 wavelength. Okay. So if you use a high wavelength, uh, I mean high frequency ultrasonic sonic waves. So, Again, the wavelength is about 0.1 millimeters, 400 times that uh, is 40 millimeters, which is 4 centimeters. So 20,000 hertz, 20, uh, I mean uh, 20 megahertz will penetrate about 2 inches. Yeah. All right, so... You want better resolution, you use higher frequency. But you use higher frequency, you penetrate less. Okay, so you have to compensate. Okay. All right, now here's how the ultrasonic waves work. So, by the way, this is a transducer. A transducer is converting, is producing the ultrasound waves. It's using a, a piezoelectric crystals. This is a speaker and a microphone. So what this does is it'll send out an ultrasonic pulse and then waits and listens. And the reflected pulse is what it's listening to. So it has got a speaker and a microphone. Okay. All right, what this is saying is, so this is the pulse that was sent and that is being reflected. When the reflection, so this was reflected by a uh, so this was the intensity of reflection and this is the time delay. Okay, so if the time delay is not too m much, then it was reflected from here. This pulse was reflected from a deeper position. Okay. So you use this information and the con computer constructs an image. Okay. And we'll come to more details about that. Okay, one of the things you have to worry about is electrical safety. Okay, the main concern is you don't want to send the heart into ventricular fibrillation. Anybody aware of that? How many of you are? What does that mean? Hmm? What does... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry? It is beating. It's just beating... I'm sorry? On chaotic heartbeat. Okay. So, uh, so these are the atria. The atria will pump blood into the ventricles. And it has to contract at the same time. The ventricles have to contract at the same time to pump blood, uh, the right ventricle to the lungs and this, the left ventricle to the body. If the contraction is chaotic and random, then you're not pumping blood to the lungs or to the body, and that can be fatal. And once the heart goes into ventricular fibrillation, it'll stay there. You have to jolt it out by shock. Okay. 
a very small current directly through the heart can send it into ventricular fibrillation. So let's say if somebody is having an open heart surgery or their pacemaker leads are exposed and there's a chance of giving them a, a shock and sending them into ventricular fibrillation. You put stents in, so there's, if there's a chance of electrical currents going through the heart directly, then there's a danger to the patient. Yeah. So we'll talk about safety issues there. Yeah. <clears throat> a muscle contracts when the cells depolarize. Okay. So the electrical impulses going through the heart, that's what's measured here. Okay. And this is for a regular heartbeat. The contraction sign starts at this um, SA node and then, um, and then the ventricles contract. So there's a sequence to the beating of the heart. Okay. And this is the proper electrical signal. Okay. So we'll talk about these guys. So the electrocardiogram is a recording of the electrical impulses that control the beating of the heart. Okay. So there's the regular beat beating. So electrocardiograms give detailed information about the condition of the heart. Okay. Similarly, you can obtain information about electroencephalograms. Okay. So has anybody here seen, done an electroencephalogram or has seen one? You guys know what that is? I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry? Okay. Well, you know, between seizures, uh, the brain waves are normal. No, right. she did She's normal now? Yeah, she's fine. Okay. Bye. That's good. Yeah. So they get electrical signals, so you're me measuring potential difference between various nodes, points. You're measuring about microvolts which is a millionth of a ball. This is the kind of signals you get. And then from these signals, they see what this signal, I, it looks complicated, but it is a combination of many waves that do a Fourier transform of that. Okay. And then, you know, it's still part art, part science. We don't know exactly how things work, but, you know, that's, so they study those waves and they can surmise if there is any problems. Yep. So I used to have to get them done like once a year. Mm -hmm. um, and I would notice like when I was chewing or like doing anything or like drinking water, mm -hmm. it would make it spit out and it's like the same thing with like the electrical waves that they would see. Yeah, I mean so to contract your muscle, any muscle, you have to fire fire the muscle. The electrical impulses there are much larger than here. So it's like uh, we're talking and stuff like that. And let's say there is a thunder. Your muscle contraction was thunder. But you can't hear our conversation during thunder. That'll swamp it. All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to quickly go over a couple of these slides, uh, 1050, right? I'm uh, hoping that we can do the quiz today. Okay. So there's a couple of, uh, <coughs> okay, so how many of you are wearing contacts? Okay. 
see half the class either contacts or glasses. Okay. So we mostly have myopia. What that means is, okay, so for me, myopia just means we can only see nearby objects without A. Far off objects, uh, our eyes cannot focus them on the retina. So here's what's happening for myopic eyes. For far off objects, this is in, at infinity, but if an object is here, the eye is focusing the image in front of the retina. For your eyes to process, what you want is a sharp image there on the retina. Yep. So to fix that problem, so here is the far point. For this eye, here is the far point. The far point just means the eye can't focus past that point. So I, I can't focus beyond this point. So if I remove my glasses, she's a blur. Okay. So what did this glass do for me? This was my far point. What did this thing do for me? So it took her and made an image of her within this point. And now my eye can take her. Okay. And that's what a concave lens will do. Here is a hyper myopic eye. He, this eye can see far off objects, but cannot see close by objects. So roughly your range is from 25 centimeters to infinity. But if you, if you have trouble focusing close by eyes, close by images, to focus close by images, you have to make your lens thick. Your muscles have to, ciliary muscles have to contract. And if they're not able to contract and make the muscles lens thick enough, then you have trouble focusing this. And so that happens as you get older. So I would have to hold my book like that for you know? No, thicker glasses just means uh, the, you have bad problems. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy thinner glasses, but they're expensive. So what so when you go to the optician so they'll sell you various things refractive index of the glass this is cheap this is very expensive <laughs> okay so refractive index higher the refractive index thinner the glasses and so on i don't get any money from them cheap glasses Zenny.com. <laughs> All right. So we'll talk about fixing those issues. Okay, I want to tell you one more thing. I'll let you guys read this electromagnetic. Um, okay, so electromagnetic waves are waves that have both electric and magnetic fields in them. Um, all right, tell you what, I don't want to rush. We will do the quiz for this chapter the first thing when we come back next class. You guys understand? Okay. But you'll take an exam. So what I'm going to do is right after the class ends, I'm going to open up the exam for this chapter. The quiz will be from the same question bank, but you'll do the quiz next uh, class. I'll open the exam. It's got uh, 25 questions. Uh, It'll, you'll have 50 minutes to do it once you start it, and you have to finish it by next Wednesday midnight. Okay, so you always have a week window to do the exam. Okay. So here is an electromagnetic wave. You can see that, okay, so the red lines are electric field and the blue lines are magnetic fields. So electromagnetic waves have both electric fields and magnetic fields, and that's the direction in which the wave is traveling. 
and the electric and magnetic fields are perpendicular to each other. Okay, and you can see that's the wavelength. And different wavelengths are different waves. So X-rays have smaller wavelengths. Visible light, the light that you can see, has longer wavelengths. Radio waves and infrared light have even longer wavelengths. Infrared light has longer wavelength than what you can see. Ultraviolet light has shorter wavelength than you can see. X-rays have even shorter wavelengths. Why do we use different wavelengths? Remember, very good. What's your name? I love you. Tia. <laughs> Thank you, Tia. So you guys understand that? So the waves, the wavelength determines what is the smallest thing you can see. Okay. So if you wanted to see atoms, you'd have to use x-rays. X-rays are roughly the size of the atom. Okay. But also the depth to which it penetrates depends on the wavelength as well. Okay. All right, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum, okay? So um, All right, so you see as the wavelength decreases, and by the way, so let me get to, so you have to remember this one formula for all waves. Velocity of all waves is frequency times the wavelength. As the wavelength decreases, the frequency increases, okay? The energy of a wave, uh, waves, electromagnetic waves come in packets called photons, okay? They're like little bullets of light. And the energy of the photon is H times F. The higher the frequency, higher the energy. Okay. So, okay, so lower the wavelength, higher the frequency, higher the energy. Okay. All right, so let's, so gamma rays, are the highest frequency, they are the highest energy. They use that in, if you want to kill cancer cells and stuff like that, okay. X-rays, okay. So X-rays, we use X-rays in uh, seeing if you have broken bones and stuff like that, but they can be damaging, so you don't want to sit under an X-ray light bulb, okay. Ultraviolet light, so visible light, that's the narrow band of frequencies that we can sense okay, using our eye. Infrared light is longer wavelength. You can feel the heat. Okay. And microwaves, radio waves, and so on. Okay. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum. And this shows you so what you can see with these waves. So gamma rays, if you use gamma rays, you can see a nucleus, x-rays, you can see atoms, ultraviolet light, you can uh, you know, you can see large molecules and so on. Visible light, you can see cells and microbes and stuff like that under a microscope, okay? All right, we'll briefly talk about this thing, okay? Spectral analysis, spectral analysis. Okay, so this is a useful tool in detection of trace, trace amounts of toxic substances. So, um, <clears throat> uh, if there was a trace amount of toxic substance someplace, how do we tell? Have you come across any of this stuff? Okay, so let's uh, go do a model of an atom. We don't have a periodic table here. Okay, so here's the nucleus. What are these fellas? Those are protons. What are these guys? Neutrons. Neutrons. The electrons are arranged in shells like this. Okay, how many electrons would this atom have? I'm sorry? How many electrons does this atom have? So there are three protons, so it'll have to have three electrons. 
okay, for the atom to be neutral. One, two, three. So this is a very simplified model, okay? What are these guys? These are shells. These are the only orbitals where the electrons can stay. How many shells does this atom have? Well, an infinite number of shells. All these guys are empty. That's all. Okay. Those are higher energy levels. What this is, this is a lithium atom. Okay. You can look this on a table. Okay. Now you can excite this atom. There are various ways to excite this atom. And exciting it, oops. And exciting an atom just means that you're taking the electron and putting it in a higher energy level. Okay, so let's excite this atom. Remove this guy and put him there. You could excite him to there that's a higher in energy level. You know, need more energy to excite it. Okay. Now, this fellow, in general, doesn't stay in the excited states too long. Maybe a trillionth of a second. He'll fall right back. Yeah. And then when he falls, he emits a photon of light. You guys understanding all this? Ask questions. I'm sorry? Um, so you're getting sunlight. Mm -hmm. A lot of your light is coming like this. Uh, uh, the heat produced is exciting the atoms, and when the atoms are falling back, they're sending the light. Did you guys understand that? Here is the kicker. Every atom, the levels are different. Okay, so when you go from here to here, you s send out a frequency. When you go from here to here, the energy difference is larger. You're sending a higher frequency photon. Okay. Every atom has a different set of levels. So every atom can send a bunch of frequencies, but the bunch of frequency every atom can send is different. It's the atom's fingerprint. Every atom and molecule has a unique fingerprint. So you want to detect trace amounts of anything, all you do is heat, heat the sucker up and look at the light coming from it. Yeah. So that's how we know what's in the atmosphere of the sun, what's in the atmosphere of various planets and stuff like that. Okay. So Okay, so so you see these are lines. Okay, this this line so this was uh, in an atmosphere if there is hydrogen and you pass light through the hydrogen, the hydrogen atom is absorbing this. Only hydrogen will absorb that line. There is the iron and so on. Okay. So if there was a toxic substance, you heat it, those are the only frequencies it would emit. Okay. So that's what spectroanalysis is. And um, Okay, so you guys seen x-rays. X-rays uh, are high energy waves, so they can be damaging. Okay, so you don't want to sit under an X-ray bulb. Okay, and uh, okay, in a lot of things that we measure, we'll measure length, mass, and time, and other things as well. But um, so length will be measured in meters. That is the SI unit for measuring length. Mass will be in kilograms, and time will be measured in seconds. Okay. All right, guys. Um, so we will 